Good morning. morning. It's good to see each of you at the Lord's house. Got some folks back from vacation. No, we got some away on vacation this week, but we're delighted you're here. If you're a guest, we're especially delighted you're here with us. In the back of the pews in front of you, you should find one of these cards. If you're a first-time guest or a second-time guest, if you don't mind, just fill out as much as you feel comfortable. Take that with you to the uh, visitor's center at the back left of the the sanctuary on your way out and we have a gift that we would like to share with you and for if you're here and you just got maybe a prayer need or or something else you, that you want to talk about uh, there's opportunities on the front and the back of the card to do that as well and encourage you to do that drop it in the offering plate on your way out uh, we would greatly appreciate it again glad you're here with us today hope you've come prepared to worship we've already started to do that this morning If you're able, if you would rise to your feet, we're going to ask Brother Matt to come. He's going to open us in song this morning. We'll do the first, second, last stanzas where the soul never dies. To Canaan's land I'm on my way where the soul prayer this morning, obviously, remembering our service. Lord, speak to us this morning. We've all got needs. and Let's remember our church this morning, shall we? Let's pray. Father, we, by humbling your presence this morning, Father, as we approach your throne, just uh, thank you for this beautiful day, for the opportunity to be back here, Lord, and so thankful for the ones that were able to come out, Father, to worship you, a true and living God. Thankful for your spirit that's already here with us. Father, for how you've blessed us thus far. And we're just looking forward to what you have in store for us. Father, especially through the message this morning with our brothers, he stands before us. God, you just anoint him. Speak to him. Father, make it easy for him as he stands here this morning. His words will be your words. They find their way to our hearts and our minds that as we leave here, we may share that with someone else. And again, God, we're mindful of those that are not with us, mindful of the needs that are here this morning. We lift those up to you as well. But, Father, most importantly, we lift up that lost soul that may be here this morning. Father, someone who doesn't know you, hadn't made that transition, what a day that would be for that individual or those folks Father, to come to know you as our personal Savior. Speak to him today. And God, again, 
Above all else, we thank you for Christ. Father, that he took our sins, and he didn't have to, but he did. Made a way for us. We thank you for that today. Help us, God, to be examples for you as we leave here. Father, when people see us, that they might see you. We give you praise today in your name. Amen. You may be seated. If you would, go ahead and be turning with me to the book of Ephesians. Book of Ephesians and the fourth chapter is where we're going to be taking our scripture in just a, a few moments. At the end of service today, we're going to be talking about uh, a lot of announcements and things that's, that's coming up. Um, we've got several, a couple of key kind of days here at, at the church, and, and it starts next week with, with homecoming, and then what kind of ends the month around our, our fall festival. And, and during the fall festival is always a time that's, that's geared around the, the worldly holiday or festival of Halloween. And this morning as I was, or this week, not this morning, this week as I was Preparing on what I would preach, the Lord kind of had me change course of my plan a little while back. I had planned on preaching a, an entire series through the book of Galatians and, and Paul writing to that church. And, and today, I uh, uh, have a kind of just a, a, a random message, what I would consider. It wasn't something that had been pre-planned months in advance. It was something the Lord just kind of put on my heart and um, it's we're going to talk about this this thought of the devil's playground. We we think this month with all the people decorating and doing that, it it, it brings some images to light and things that sometimes, at least for me, makes me uncomfortable. Some of the movies that are out do that, but but in in seriousness, we know probably most of it's just for fun and games. But today in this scripture, we're going to talk about some stuff that is serious. So, some things that are serious, and, and as Paul's writing this part of this letter, and he's writing a letter to the church, we have to remember that. As he's writing this part of the letter, we're picking up kind of in the middle of a conversation about this old and new man, this, this old and new person, this one that we're supposed to be uh, transitioning from this old person to this new person when we become a believer in Christ, and when we do that, there should be some things that change, some things that to take place. So we're going to look at it kind of in this mindset of this, this playground mentality. Whenever I was a kid, probably like a lot of you, I used to enjoy going to the playground. Now, I lived out in the country on a farm. We didn't have a, a park close by that we could go to, but at school we would have different pieces of playground equipment growing up through elementary school, and there were several things that I enjoyed doing. I, one of my favorite things was a merry-go-round. We get that thing spinning so much, you try to grab on, you go flying if you weren't careful, just grabbing a hold of it. Uh, we used to have teeter-totters, swings, all kinds of different things. And today we're going to look at, at that, seeing how kind of Satan can take the things of this life, the things that seem good, the things that seem fun, and if we let him have his way, he can use those to be disruptive. So if you've got your Bibles there, I'm going to begin just by kind of setting the, pre the preface for the, the message. Starting at verse 21, like I say, we're picking up in the middle of this discussion. This is what it says. In verse 21 it says, If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus... That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So, so as, it, as we see what it's, what it's starting to tell us is this thing, that we put off this old person when we become a believer, when we become a follower of Jesus, when we allow him to come in and take control of our life, which is truly what should take place, it's not, a lot of people misinterpret, mis misread what salvation is. Some people just think it's, it's God forgiving me and giving me a pass to get into heaven. And, and that's not what salvation is. Salvation is putting our trust in Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. 
And we can't have one without the other. He can't just be our Savior. He has to be our Lord also. So here in this passage, he's talking about what takes place when we go from this old person, this person that strived after the ways of man, the things, the, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, as the Scripture says. And, and we start to change our focus, change our direction based on what God has for us. So in the remaining part of this chapter, we're going to look at four specific things that he talks about that are struggles for us. And, and listen, these are struggles for all of us. I'm not perfect. Just because I'm a preacher does not make me perfect. I struggle with a lot of these things as well. But four specific things that he tells us that we need to be careful not to allow Satan to work in our lives. The first thing that we, we look at here. In verse 25, and, and also down in verse 29, it touches on it, is this merry-go-round of talk. The merry-go-round of talk. Look at verse 25 and 29. It says, Therefore put away, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And then down at 29, it goes on and says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So the first thing it talks about is this, our talk, our communication. And like I say, I consider it like the merry-go-round, right? It tells us about the old man. It tells us of a couple of things, a few things that we should not partake in any longer. Things that we're, we're, we're prone to do in the flesh. One, it talks about is lying. It says that we should put away lying. It also talks about putting away rumors, the spreading of rumors and, and of gossip. And, and then it goes on down into verse 29 talks about not only gossip, but it says corrupt words that proceed from our mouth, using filthy language, doing things that we ought not do. I, I, I've told some of you this in times past or maybe mentioned in a sermon years ago, but I can remember being in middle school. And, and, and this is a memory that has haunted me. For, for probably all of my life. And it's not that I don't know that God doesn't forgive, and He does. But I think it's something He's always kept stuck in my mind so that I can remind others of the same thing. I can remember being in middle school. And, and, and as in middle school, the way middle school is, peer pressure is a big thing. I, I can remember being in our shop class. We had uh, different classes we rotated to, and, and every, every year we had to take shop for a few weeks. I don't know how long it was, but, but while we were in there, the teacher was out. He was in the hallway. He was off doing something else, and one of the students in our shop class went around to every student, every boy, every girl. He didn't care who it was, and he went around and asked them to say a bad word, say, say he would try to get you to say whatever. And I can remember as he went around the room and it finally got to me and me being nervous in middle school and awkward and worried about what everybody was going to think, I did it just like everybody else. And when we got to the end of the class, teachers still hadn't come back, went to every desk, every station, and everybody said something they shouldn't have. He, he made a statement that would forever change my life. He said, well, it's good to know nobody in here is a Christian. And it still gives me cold chills. I thought, man, me being peer, just having peer pressure and just, just saying one ugly word made that kind of statement to this person and, and allowed him to make that statement to the whole class. Now, I'm, I'm not perfect. I, 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 I try to, to do what's right. But from that point on, I've tried to watch my words. As far as I know, my, I mean, my wife and I celebrated 20 years of marriage last year. I don't think she's ever heard me say a cuss word. My kids haven't heard me say it. I, I try to watch what I say because of the image that it portrays. Here it tells us we have to get rid of those things as an old man. The Scripture tells us, and I'll, I'll use the Andy Mathias paraphrase here. It says, how can you... Can you cuss and praise God out of the same mouth? How can you do that? Here it says the old man does these things. It says that we need to put those away. But here's what it tells us with the new man in those verses. It says, let each one of you speak truth 
with his neighbor. That we speak truth, that we speak honesty, that we show love. And sometimes truth is not easy. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we have to be, we have to be direct and we have to be honest out of love. I'm not saying that we need to be passive aggressive or that we need to, to go and, and try to, to, to speak judgment on somebody, but we need to be honest. And then it goes on in verse 29 and it tells us that those words that we say, he says, but let what is good for, necess- good for necessary edification. Edification, John taught a class on it back earlier this year on Wednesday nights. And, and it's talking about lifting up other people. Speak words that help to lift each other up. We live in a world that is focused on tearing other people down. It doesn't matter if it's political, if it's the red versus the blue. It doesn't matter if it's national country versus country. Sometimes it's religion versus religion and denomination versus denomination. Here he says, don't do that. He says, speak words that lift each other up and then do it. It says that it may impart grace to the hearer. That we might impart grace. That's what we should be doing with our our mouths. We should share the truth of who God is. We should try, we should strive to build people up, not tear each other down. So that ultimately, the grace, the love of God can can be absorbed by people. Listen, there's people that have all kinds of different opinions. I've got plenty of opinions. You ask my, my family, you ask some of my closest friends, I probably got way more opinions than they want me to have because they hear them. But my opinions are not what's going to change people's eternity. And, and that's what's important. We need to be careful of what we say because the things that we say can have a lasting impact. Kind of like the merry-go-round, you, you know what I, I, I found out over the years What goes around comes around. What goes around truly comes around. If you put trash on a merry-go-round and you spin it to think it's going to get away from you, guess what? It's going to return back, and if you keep it on there, it's going to keep getting nastier. And, And that's how it is in this life. If we pray and we expect God's blessings, is that really what we're sharing? Are we going to get a return on, on what we're doing? Here he talks about being careful of our talk. The, the second thing that he talks about, we're going to call it the teeter-totter of temper. Look at verses 26 and 27. It goes on and it says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Second thing he talks about is our, our temper. Here it, it tells us that, first off, and, and, and I want you to understand this, anger is a normal emotion. It, anger can be caused by lots of things. Typically, uh, there's a few categories of things. First thing that can cause anger, we don't want to admit it a lot of times, but the first thing that can cause anger is our own sin. When, when we do something wrong, It can sometimes cause us to get angry and get angry at other people because we're trying to to mask what we've done. Another thing that causes anger is other people's sin, when other people do stuff wrong. But then also there's other things. When our convictions are compromised, when we don't get our way, there's other things that happen that cause anger sometimes. But here's what it tells us. The old man, it allows anger to cause us, kind of like a teeter-totter. Y'all ever remember being on the teeter-totter? You know what you do? You go up and down. It, it's kind of like anger can cause us to, to be on an emotional roller coaster. If we allow it to, to grow within us and cause problems, because it tells us there in this scripture what it will eventually do is turn into wrath. And we need to be careful not to do that. What The difference in anger and wrath is, anger is an emotion. Again, we, we have reasons that causes us to be angry, but wrath causes us to want to seek revenge. And we need to be careful not to do that. Don't allow that anger to keep welling up inside of you that it causes you 
to respond or think of others or other people, groups, things in the wrong way. It goes on, talks about the new man, it tells us there how that we, we need to, to deal with it. Again, reminder, anger isn't sin. To be angry is not sin. It tells us in Scripture that God gets angry. Sin makes God angry. Sin, God is a righteous judge. He's going to judge sin. He, he, he's not happy with it, but it's about how we respond out of it. And, and if we understand what this passage is telling us here, there is a way that we need to respond when anger comes upon us. And, and, and the easiest way that we do that is do what God has done. Whenever we find ourselves angry, you know how we should respond. We should respond with grace, mercy, mercy. And reconciliation. What do I mean by that? First off, what's grace? Grace is getting what we don't deserve. That's what grace is. It's this gift from God that he has given us that we don't deserve. That's as simple as I can put it. When we get angry with someone or something about something, we, we need to, to show grace. The, the next thing we need to do is show mercy. Mercy is something else that God shows us. The simplest way I can describe mercy is it's almost the opposite of grace, not in a bad way, but mercy is not getting what we do deserve. When God shows us mercy, he doesn't give us what we deserve. So when we find ourselves again angry, we need to show grace and we need to show mercy and then we ought to seek out reconciliation. And what's reconciliation? That's restoring broken relationships. The Scripture tells us that we as believers are supposed to be about the ministry of reconciliation. That should be our, our, our goal. That's what Actually, Paul is the one that writes that. That's what we should seek. And you say, why should we do all those things? Because that's the example Christ set for us. Jesus, when he went to the cross, when he climbed up the hill to what we call Mount Calvary, but in that day they called it Golgotha, the place of the skull. It wasn't as beautiful of a place as we think of it. And it's beautiful for us because of what it offers us, but it wasn't physically a beautiful sight. As he did that, if, if he was human, if he was like us, you know what he would have been doing? Climbing that hill saying, man, I'm doing this for that sorry old Andy. Man, I can't believe Matt's done this and made me have to go up here and die for him. I, I can't believe that Caleb wouldn't, wouldn't stop sinning and I have to go up here and shed my blood. That isn't what he does. He offers he, his prayer, even there in the garden, not my will but yours is a prayer of grace and mercy for us so that we can have reconciliation with God, so that we can have that broken relationship restored. That's what he wants for you today. And then after that, that's what he wants us to share with other people. So we, we, we don't need to climb on that teeter-totter of temper. The third thing it tells us in this passage is verse 28. It goes on and says, let him who stole no longer, no, steal no longer, but let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. The, the third thing is the, the swings of theft. The third, third stop in the devil's playground is the, the swings of theft. When, when we think of, of of this, and, and we think of the old man, the old person that we used to be in the flesh. It, it likes to take from others and, and don't care, doesn't think about things. How many of y'all, when you were kids, ever, ever got pushed on a swing? Y'all, some of y'all slow to respond. Some of you didn't get to go to the park, I guess. I don't know. Maybe y'all were bad. Y'all got left at home. But how many of you, you got pushed on a swing? How many of you enjoyed getting pushed on a swing? We all enjoyed that, right? Kicking our legs, seeing how high we could go. How many of you ever had to be the pusher? Most of us, right? 
But if you went to the park and you saw the swing set there, how many of you said, hey, I want to be the pusher? Nobody, right? Everybody wants to climb on this swing. Everybody wants to get pushed, see how high they can go and do that. Nobody wants to be the person. Nobody volunteers to push. Here in the scripture, it tells us, let him who stole steal no longer. We, we live in a day and age where theft is common. And I'm not talking about just what we see on social media or, or on Twitter or whatever it's called now, X or whatever it is, or on the news. I mean, there's crazy stuff happening in some of these cities where uh, shoplifting and stuff's going rampant. But, but there's, there's plenty of stealing that takes place. We think about just society as a whole. People are happy to take from organizations, take from the government, just live off the system. There, there's plenty of times that probably each one of us at, at some point in time have been guilty from, from stealing from our workplace. Maybe, maybe you uh, fudged on the timesheet, or maybe you don't give the best effort always. Sometimes we even steal from the church. And I'm, I'm not talking about tithing. I'm talking about just giving of our time and our talents. We don't give back what we've been blessed by. See, it's, nobody wants to be the one that's pushing. That requires work. We want, it's, it's in our flesh. We want to be the one hanging out on the swing. The one having somebody else work for us. But here it says the new man... The new man recognizes the labor that's required. That when we become a new person in Christ, we recognize that it has that it requires some labor. And listen, kind of like back on the old thing, how, how often do we thank God that we have a job? I, I, I've been asked, I get asked stuff with the, within the financial world a lot. And, and not to go in depth, but just this last week as I was out in Missouri for some meetings and stuff, and we was talking about the, the market and the economy and all these things, one, one thing I brought up is I, I, one of the things I think that's, in spite of all the inflation and everything else, one of the things that's really sustaining us is right now, anybody that wants to work can go get a job. And they can make good money doing it. It's not hard. I mean, there's still plenty of people hiring. We, we have lived through times where unemployment was high where you couldn't go out and have a job. Sometimes we take these things for granted. We need to thank God that we have the ability to go out and to work. I know plenty of people that physically can't go out and do what they want to do and be able to, to live and get by. It tells us that when we do that, what does it go on and say? It says that, me, that let him work with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need tells us that we, we shouldn't just be living off of everybody else. It actually says that we should be assisting other people. That's what this new man does. It isn't seeing how much I can hoard up for myself. It's actually how much can I give others. And let me tell you, folks, again, I'm, I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I'm not saying I'm great at this. But there is nothing like being able to help other people. It's, it's nothing like being able to go out to a restaurant and just the Lord saying something to you, and you just leave that person a hundred dollar tip, or or you see somebody that seems like they're struggling, and you go buy them a gift card and send it in the mail anonymously, or or whatever the case may be. There's there's no joy that you can have greater in helping others than to be able to be generous to people. Here it says that we need to be people that have the right mindset. It's not about what we can hoard up for ourselves, what we can take, how we can get the advantage. Let somebody else push us. It's about us volunteering to do the pushing. Even in the church, it's about moving our mentality. from, from this, is, this is what we do. This is what we're guilty of a lot of times. I've been there. I've been, been guilty of it is what can the church do for me? Being a consumer of the church instead of a producer. See, it tells us that we're supposed to be people. It, it ultimately tells us that we're the hands and feet of Christ. 
that God has chosen us to be part of his bigger picture, that we were born with a purpose and part of God's plan, and he wants us to engage in it. The very final thing that it talks about, final, final place in the playground we want to hit on before we, we wrap up here, is the, the sandbox of treasure. The sandbox of treasure. Y'all, anybody ever play in the sandbox when you were a kid? I used to like a sandbox. I had one at our house. Actually, at, out on the farm, we actually had a, a, a thing that Dad had built, and I'd have my Tonka truck and my excavator and do all. I used to love it. Love the sandbox. Look what it goes on and says here, 30 through 32. It finishes up, and it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, of by whom... You were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Say, I used to love playing in the sandbox. Another thing I used to enjoy doing whenever I was a kid my dad went through years where this was like one of his little pet hobbies, passions that he used to do. He would take me and my sister at separate times, and we were little bitty, and we would go out and look for airheads. We called it airhead hunting. We lived out by a river, and there used to be all kinds of places where they had encamped, and we used to have a collection of, of nice ones and broken pieces and all that. Used to enjoy that. Just go out and see what you could find. The problem is whether you're in the sandbox looking for some buried treasure that maybe been there for a week or two that you forgot about, or whether you're out in the field looking for airheads, or maybe you've got a metal detector and you're out digging looking for something from the Civil War or, or some coin or some ring. Guess what happens? You got to get your hands dirty. You, you, to, to, to find what you're seeking for, you got to get your hands dirty. And, and here, if we spend our lives. Again, talking about this thing with the old man, it says don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And how, how do we grieve the Holy Spirit? We do it if we, if we spend our lives focused on worldly treasure and gain. And it tells us there's some characteristics that come out of us when we do it. If you spend your life, if your life is focused on worldly treasure and gain, if you've got that mindset, here's what you're going to find yourself struggling with oftentimes. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, and malice. All these things, these characteristics that come out in us when we focus on worldly things. And what's it ultimately tell us that happens? We prevent the Holy Spirit from working in us and through us, and we find ourselves dirty. That's what we find ourselves dirty. Just getting, getting filthy for no reason. And by saying dirty, we find ourselves back living in sin. That's what we're talking about. It tells us there's, he has a desire for us. This new man. This new person that we're to be. Verse 32, he says there. That the new man promotes the Holy Spirit. And how does he do it? Think of these three things. And be kind to one another. Kindness. Just imagine if all the Christians in our community made a conscious effort to go out and show kindness this week. When, when, when people do something that makes you mad, maybe they do something sinful. You don't judge them, you just are kind to them anyway. It says to be tenderhearted, to, to be people that, that show affection and compassion for one another, to truly care about somebody. I mean, it's really easy in passing and say, hey, how are you doing? But listen, as I've been here today, talked to two or three different people that said, what's going on? Where's so-and-so? What's, what's going on? And, and hear about it, and it sticks with me. And I, I, I'll write it down, and I'll pray about it. And it will be a burden for me because it's a burden for them to be tenderhearted. 
And then the final one, it says to be forgiving. That we show grace and that we show mercy. So ultimately, we're seeking, we're seeking this restoration of a relationship. We're seeking reconciliation. That's his desire for us. He, he wants the, the new man, the new person, to truly be the church that Christ died for. Think about that. Christ died for the church, for all of us. It says that he tasted death for everyone. That's his desire, that all come to know him. Well, you know what? We might be preventing people from coming to know him because we're out playing in the devil's playground. Instead of carrying the characteristics of Christ and living in the Holy Spirit. Maybe today you've got something you've been dealing with. Maybe something you've been struggling with. Maybe there's anger. Maybe there's hatred. Maybe there's some things that you need to forgive others. And, and, and maybe they haven't asked. Maybe they don't care. They don't want your forgiveness. doesn't matter. You've got to let it go. That, that might be what's preventing you from being able to show them Christ. I, I'm, I'm quite, quite confident today. We can all say none of us want what we deserve. And we can all say, man, I'm glad God has given me what I don't deserve as well. That he's shown me that grace and mercy. Maybe there's somebody in your life, maybe it's your neighbor, maybe it's somebody in your family that you need to show that same grace and mercy to. Maybe today we need to say, we need to be more like Christ and less like me. Maybe today you're here and you need to, to accept him. Maybe you need to take that first step. You need to take and put away that old person and take on this new person that he wants you to be. If you would, if you're able, rise to your feet. Brother Matt's going to lead us in this song of invitation. And as he does that, if you, if you need to come pray today, would you do that? Would you be obedient as we sing? You do that today.